So AMD has a Ryzen 2 series unboxing embargo lift going live today. We're going to cut all the bullshit and get straight to it. So I have a couple of numbers to share with you all. Some of them are specs. You'll hear from everyone else. We'll put that at the end. Some of it is some preliminary preconditions for testing that we need to talk about because Ryzen 2000 series, 2700X, the 2600X, 2600, and the 2700, all of which I have here in front of me, uh, have some interesting things that we need to take into consideration when benchmarking CPUs. They're a little bit different from the original Ryzen series. And so we found a couple of things in the past month of testing where uh, we need to lay a bit of it out on the table and show what are we looking at going into the benchmarking, how are we normalizing for variables, things like that. So today we're going to be talking about the Ryzen 2000 series. I have a couple of caveats I'll share with you after this ad break. This video is brought to you by Thermaltake's View 37 case. The View 37 focuses on highlighting custom PC builds with its full panoramic window and tinted front acrylic. In our thermal testing, the View 37 performed reasonably well when considering its looks-focused build, which is partly thanks to the airflow design and the removal of a bottom power supply shroud. For a balance of looks and performance, check the link in the description below for the View 37. Couple reminders, AMD didn't sample us for this one. Technically, we're not under their embargo for the CPUs. We could have posted the reviews quite a while ago. Uh, we're not doing it for a few reasons. One of them is out of respect for other reviewers. And the other one is because just working with AMD for the Threadripper launch, we talked with them and said, hey, uh, this special embargo is for some media thing is not cool. And they gave us their word they wouldn't do it again. So provided that remains true, we will show some trust and hold the review until embargo lifts. So even though we can post it today, stick around because April 19th, I think at 9 a.m. Eastern is when the official review embargo lifts. That's when we'll post all of the performance numbers uh, as opposed to just a couple of short things today. But either way, a couple of big things. Let's just get straight into it. The boards, the motherboards are a big change. X470 boards so far, we have a couple of them and they are much stronger in the motherboard BIOS department than the original Ryzen launch. There are some memory timing issues I'll be showing you in a moment with some charts, but overall, the boards are better with heatsink design in some cases, as you saw at CES. Uh, they are more stable overall. We've only had a few blue screens. I'd like that to be zero blue screens, but so far all of the blue screens we've had have been entirely related to memory timings and that can be adjusted for as EFI matures, which the board vendors will do as they always do post launch. Uh, so really overall, it's a lot more stable than Ryzen 1 was at launch. We're pretty happy with what we've seen thus far. It's looking like it'll shape up to be a good launch uh, in general. But again, we need to finish up the review and see if there's anything else to discover. Boards are also shipping with some interesting toggles. So XFR 2, and precision boost are things to keep in mind now with testing. XFR is extended frequency range. It gives AMD uh, an extra couple hundred megahertz in best cases for limited thread applications. So if you're using one or two threads, you get some extended frequency range, as the name implies, on top of the, the advertised base and boost clocks. So XFR is boosted now with XFR2. They have a couple of new parameters we'll be talking about in the review. Precision boost has changed as well. And these are configured in a way that some of the boards shipping stock that we've tested with no modifications, all auto, will uh, push the CPUs in a way that exits TDP. So you start increasing the power consumption by dozens of watts in some cases uh, over TDP, but you get more performance. It's a bit of a question of, what's the correct way to test it. And so rather than asking that existential question, we tested both and then we'll let you decide in the review. Uh, but that's something to keep an eye on because it's similar in some ways to how MCE pushes Intel CPUs outside of their specification. The difference is XFR is an advertised actual feature of AMD CPUs as opposed to a motherboard vendor pre-overclock. So uh, philosophically, they're a bit different in terms of if you look at one as fair, but not the other. Then again, though, if it exits the TDP specification, uh, that's another debate entirely, and we'll get into that in the review. So something to keep in mind when the reviews go live is, uh, was XFR2 enabled, was Precision Boost 2 enabled, were any other sort of overclocking features enabled, whether or not you consider them to be overclocking features. So yeah, that's, that's something to keep an eye on, something that we had to take into account because we noticed really high power consumption in some cases, but not others, and then performance was impacted as well. Other considerations for testing outside of these 
We need to talk about relative performance scaling on memory. This is something we've talked about a lot with Ryzen. We talked about it with the APUs. And uh, it comes down to memory kits and the motherboard timings and their ability to interact with those kits. So Ryzen has been more sensitive to memory kits than Intel CPUs. And it's not, I should say, than Intel platforms. Because this isn't a matter of necessarily Ryzen as an architecture cares more or Intel as an architecture cares less. It's more about the motherboard timings and the tuning in BIOS and whether or not it's been optimized for the specific kit of memory you're using. Because Ryzen is still a relatively immature platform and I don't mean that in a derogatory way, I mean it's literally a year old in terms of market consumption, whereas Intel has been on the same platform for eons at this point. Uh, so that's something that'll, that, that will become better with age, and it's not that bad these days anyway. Uh, but there is an important thing to look at, and that's memory scaling. So we can talk about that for a bit. Uh, this is important for test planning because memory kit heavily impacts performance in some scenarios, and it's a bit of a balancing act. We can throw the best kit we have at the CPU, but it doesn't mean it'll perform well. It comes down to the motherboard and how the timings are on the motherboard and how their BIOS is for those tertiary and lower level timings. Some of our best kits, strictly from a timings and frequency perspective, actually don't perform that well, uh, whereas some of the moderate kits perform great just because the motherboard happens to support that kit better out of box in the pre-release version of BIOS. What I'm going to do now is show a chart. I mean, we'll, we'll wait till I'm done talking here, but we'll put a chart on the screen. Technically, if you're under the AMD embargo, I think you probably can't do this, but uh, we're not showing full performance. We're not going into a review. We're not using absolute numbers. We're using relative numbers. I'm allowed to do it because I didn't get the CPU from AMD. But like I said, we're holding the rest of it out of respect for other reviewers. And hopefully AMD sticks to their word to not do special uh, Threadripper style embargoes this time for, for reviewers that they favor. So uh, under those conditions, we're just going to show some relative performance scaling because I can to demonstrate the memory kit impact and why we chose one kit versus another, and also a bit of discussion on X370 versus X470 scaling with Ryzen 1000 series CPUs. I'm not gonna go into detail on which motherboards we're using today. We have most of the boards, uh, but I'll talk about the boards more post-launch. So again, these are our relative numbers. Percent offsets from a baseline 100%, which will be established with our Corsair Vengeance LPX 3200 megahertz kit, Last year sometime we began using a Guile 3200 MHz CL16 memory kit and this was provided by AMD with the R5 CPUs. So we stuck with it because we, I mean, I don't know, they sent it and it performed pretty well at the time. Now we've uh, kind of learned just from working with Ryzen 2 and the new BIOS and motherboards that that's not the best kit to use. So we did some testing here and looking at some brief numbers starting with an X470 board of an unspecified make and model we ended up at about 93% of the Corsair kit's performance when using Guile, meaning that Guile performed at about 93% of the Corsair's baseline 100% performance. This is for gaming only and is more latency intensive than applications like Blender, where memory kit matters a lot less than capacity. Our range of scaling, as you see here, is anywhere from 79% to 99.7% of total performance of the Corsair baseline kit depending on which game is being used. So there's a bit of room here. 79% is, is quite a bit lower and shows some of the weaknesses in this kit with the motherboards that we were testing on. But comparing a 1700X on X370 versus X470, same CPU, different platforms, we noticed that the earliest EFI revision, which has since been replaced, yielded poor memory timings on the X470 platform with the 1700X. It was bad enough that even 1440p testing which should almost always become a GPU benchmark by a proxy, posted 85% of baseline performance. The X370 board under the same conditions would post 91% to 99% of baseline performance, and the difference comes primarily from timing and tuning settings and other issues in general just with the early BIOS revisions of X470 as we're just applying XMP for this simple test. But it proves a point. And for that first chart, it was a 2700X stock, but again, you don't have any absolute numbers to work off of yet. So uh, things to consider, memory kit matters a lot, EFI revision matters a lot, there have already been a couple of them, and the earliest versions of BIOS that we used uh, before kind of the, the more Ryzen 2 proper BIOSes were pushed, those had issues with things like uh, XFR2 behavior and memory timings in general, just potentially causing blue screens or being 
loose enough that performance is impacted. That's being corrected, which means that we've been basically iterating on our testing and retesting stuff as new revisions have come out to make sure that we have the latest data that reflects something close to what the consumer gets. So uh, there may be a zero hour BIOS change. There normally is with all these platforms, Intel or AMD, but we're doing our best to account for those. So we'll keep the rest of the details under wraps until a review, again, out of respect of other reviewers and, and AMD's uh, show of trust to move away from special embargoes. But for now, this is information provided to illustrate what we've spent the last couple of weeks doing, uh, researching fair testing conditions, basically. So check back for more scaling information in our review. Now, as for other stuff, oh, one more thing, I guess, Ashes of the Singularity was one of the games in those charts that proves very sensitive to performance scaling. Uh, hypersensitive sometimes. That's also a matter of uh, looking into why a specific game performs a specific way. And Ash, as we talked about when Thre Threadripper launched, about the way it interacts with uh, Numa versus Uma, for example, for the memory access, stuff like that. So let's get on to the rest of the stuff now. And I said cut the bullshit earlier. This is basically that part, but it's still important information. The R5 2600, non-X, $200 for that part, six cores, 12 threads and uh, frequency listed on the screen. $230 the R5 2600X, six cores, 12 threads, a bit faster in the frequency department. The R7 2700 is where it gets interesting. So the 1700 is the CPU that we gave, we gave it an editor's choice award. We called it Ryzen's champion. Basically said, this is the R7 to get. Forget the 1800X, it's a waste of money. 1700X kind of in between them. And there are valid reasons to buy those. But when I say it's a waste of money, I mean, from our perspective, as people who would just buy the $200 cheaper at the time of launch, uh, $1,700, and then overclock it in five minutes and have something very close to an 1800X. Anyway, that point aside, the 2700 is 300 bucks. So that's 30 lower than the 1700, which we heavily endorsed and really liked at $330. So if performance remains good and the platform remains good, then $300 for a 2700 is extremely competitive. And that's something we want to see. The 2700X, which is presumably the replacement to the 1700X, is $330. And, uh, and that one, like the 2700, they're both 8-core, 16-thread. The frequency is uh, 3.7 to, to 4.3 gigahertz with XFR2 on the 2700X, and it's 3.2 to 4.1 on the 2700 non-X. You can obviously overclock. They're all unlocked just like before. So I think that's most of the basics here. We have some extra things I'd like to show, but like I said, we're going to hold it. Uh, what you really need to know is those core counts, they're basically the same core and thread counts as the preceding 1x00 numbers. So 1600, 1600x, same idea to the 2000 series, uh, same for the 2700 series. So uh, what we're left with then is waiting. April 19th is when you should check back. We're posting our review when all the others go live. Uh, at 9 a.m. Eastern on April 19th, and we'll have a ton of extra testing. This, by the way, as an aside here, as kind of a statement on the industry, this uh, experience of going through a side channel for a part has taught me and us as a team a lot because it's allowed us to get way more hands-on with something way before launch, and uh, the parts are still more or less retail ready. So hardware side, they haven't changed. EFI, stuff like that, yes, it updates. We have to iterate our testing. It's extra work in that department. But the important thing is that having this extra time when these companies typically give you about a week to test stuff has proven extremely useful and valuable because it's allowed us to troubleshoot issues, things like blue screen, stuff like that, before where zero hour on review day, you're still not sure why something's crashing or performing badly or, cra or uh, any kind of bad behavior with performance. And what you're left with is having to make a judgment call of do I mention this in the review? And if I do, how much emphasis do I put on it being the platform's fault versus how much emphasis do I put on it being maybe uh, the CPU, the motherboard, or tester error because maybe we don't understand something at a zero hour and it's hard to get in contact with the right people who actually know things. Uh, so this has given us time now that we've had several weeks to do testing for once to look into all that and eliminate any question at all of what's going on. So I feel much more confident in the review than most other reviews, which is a great feeling. It's unfortunate that you have to go through back channels to do it, basically. And uh, of course, they don't want to give you the parts too early, partially because they're trying to prevent things like leaks, all these companies, uh, partially because they're trying to control the media cycle, things like that. 
limit how much digging you can really do on a product. But what we've seen so far with Ryzen 2 is looking good. So expect a reasonable review. It actually looks like a much stronger launch than last year. So I'm pretty happy about it. It's, it's just kind of um, enlightening to me that going through this back channel for once uh, for this specific type of product has given us a much more comprehensive review and not in a way that's negative towards the product, just in, in a way that's overall positive because it teaches everybody about what's going on, how something works. You can really dig into how the how XFR2 works, stuff like that. Stuff we'd never have time for normally. So yeah, I don't really know what my plan is going forward because uh, obviously you work on building a relationship with the companies like AMD, rebuilding that relationship after arguing over the Threadripper embargoes. But at the same time, I really like understanding how stuff works ahead of launch. So it's, it's kind of weird. We have to make that balancing act now. Either way, though, check back April 19th. Subscribe for more. As always, go to patreon.com slash gamers and access helps out directly. I'll have an article linked in the description below with the specs table, uh, maybe some other basics. If you want to click that and read more, go for it. And as mentioned, store.gamersnexus.net to pick up a mod mat like this one. I'll see you all next time.